Welcome to Digital Hospitality. I am your host, Sean Walchef. This is a Cali BBQ Media production. We believe in our deep thesis, which is digital hospitality. Every business needs to be digital first, especially brick and mortar business. And every business is in the hospitality business, whether they know it or not. We also believe in the four C's, which is content, commerce, communication, and community. Today's guest is Gigi Peterkin. Gigi, I, her and I met on the social audio app Clubhouse, which is a magical place. Um, we hope that you, the listener, you, the viewer, come and join us. We have digital hospitality leaders from all over the globe, but today's guest, Gigi Peterkin. Gigi is a master when it comes to public relations, and I was having a conversation with her, and I realized we talk so much about storytelling on this show. We talk about it on the clubhouse rooms, but we haven't had an expert in public relations come on the digital hospitality show to share their expertise, um, share some of the misconceptions around public relations and share some of the best practices. So Gigi, CEO of Amplify PR. Gigi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, I am um, very grateful that we met on clubhouse. It's brought many wonderful people into my life. And it was the first time that it really occurred to me that um, I grew up around kitchens. My dad was a chef. I, I, I grew up around restaurant hospitality, but the exposure to you on Clubhouse really did make me believe that we all are in the hospitality business. And it's really changed and shaped how I've thought about things for the last several months. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I can't wait to talk to you today. I would love to to hear in the beginning of uh, when did Gigi find her love for public relations? What was it? W what what made you believe? Oh, what made you a believer? What made me a believer? Well, I found my love for storytelling as a kid. I always wrote. I am a writer at heart. I think that you meet a lot of people in PR who are um, in another life, another part of their head. They're either novelists or they <laughs> were um journalists and they've kind of been bouncing back and forth so we all see the value in stories and really in other people's stories when i was 10 years old i got a um tape recorder but i turned 10 in 1980 so it wasn't one of these small ones it was one of those big boxy handle not quite a boom box tape recorder and i took it around and i interviewed everybody in my family Really? Um, Walter Cronkite was a news person I knew. So I put on my Walter Cronkite voice. I gave them all scenarios. Somebody was an escaped from a fire and had to tell me what it was like escaping. It's just deep inside of me. Um, what made me want to start my firm was doing PR in several places, both in-house and at an agency and seeing that the people you hear about are the ones who quite honestly can write really big checks yeah. and have you craft a story for them, whether it's authentic or not? That gave me the ick in such a big way that I realized if I was going to keep doing this, I had to create terms that I could do it on. And while authenticity has kind of become a buzzword, um, we don't send clients on on pitches, you know, for stories just because we can get a placement. Uh, we we do what we call no bullshit PR. So we're really clear with our clients. If you're looking for bullshit, there's a million other agencies out there that will give you all the bullshit spin and will spin you to get you where you think you need to be. But that's not us. So I continue to believe, be a believer in PR because that's how we practice what we do. From a basic level, explain what is public relations? What is it? It is. So many people think it's really getting on the today. We used to be the Today Show or Oprah. Again, I'm yeah. old. That's what people wanted. Um, <laughs> it's it's cre it's giving the public, the general public, helping them relate to your brand, helping them relate to your product, your service, putting out lots of different type of content that allow them to do that in the positive way that you want them to. I mean, at the end of the day. I think I've even heard conversations with you. Marketing, which PR lives alongside marketing, it's a form of manipulation in that you're creating the story. And so from that standpoint, public relations are the stories that you tell so that people can relate and feel something about your brand, because really it's going to come down to feeling at the end of the day that builds those fans, that builds those repeat customers, and that can take you 
to superstar status, which is where most people want to go. The results are in National Restaurant Association show, Kyle and Sarah and myself. We were at the Davo sales tax booth and we were polling restaurant owners on the floor. This was a very unscientific poll, but the results are resounding. Restaurant owners do not like sales tax. Nobody likes sales tax. Doesn't matter what business owner you are, small business, big business, Davo automates the sales tax process. We are so grateful that Davo is the sponsor of this show. They automate sales tax at our Cali barbecue restaurants. It is $50 a month. It integrates with all the major point of sale partners, including Toast. So if you want to sleep at night, if you want to not worry about sales tax, Go to Davo, check them out, Davo Sales Tax. Uh, let us know how they're helping automate your sales tax in your restaurant so that we can share your Davo story on digital hospitality. Did you say you used you you worked in both in-house as well as in, in an agency? Did. Before you started Very your own different firm? worlds, but yes. Yeah, can I you, did. Can I... you explain the, the in-house model? At what point does a brand believe that bringing somebody in-house makes the most sense? Well, I would say that in-house PR folks are often, you find them in the corporate communications department. Um, they're the people who are telling the corporate stories. They just happen to be working for that pharmaceutical company or whatever that firm is. And they're helping the leaders. So they're preparing the leaders so that when the leaders go out to do their media, they can be prepared. They're preparing the corporate brand story so that it's cohesive and they're bringing in all of the other departments. So when we do in-house PR, that's the remit. The company is the client. You know, the leaders are your talking heads, are your media personas, media facing people, and all of the different departments at some point in time, if they've got an outward facing message, they become somebody that you have to help craft messaging for. When you were studying PR, did you have a mentor or a teacher that made a profound impact on you? And, and what did they what did they share with you? My first real PR mentor didn't happen until I went to Edelman. So um, my my background is very much from an education perspective. I have an English degree from Temple University. Um, you know, I, I might be one of the people that folks want to throw darts at. Uh, for not What's having that? That, that PR degree, I, but I don't, when I, I, I don't believe that I'm a sociologist. I have a sociology degree. <laughs> yet, I think here so, we, I, yet, yet here we are. <laughs> yet here we are, and that's I think what makes this also fascinating too, right? Yeah. Because you can't be a sociologist and see this unfold and not be interested in it. Yeah. Uh, but when I landed up in New York and I was working for the world's largest PR firm, and I knew I had to up my game, uh, a colleague there who I'm still very good friends with. And, and she's gone on to do amazing things, both in PR, as well as she's done celebrity management for some big A-list folks. She just took me under her wing and she showed me the ropes and showed me how to not get in my own way. Um, you know, I, I think this applies for people in and out of PR. Imposter syndrome can really be a bear. So, um, not letting it beat you down, but then also not knowing that the win that you had today is great, but it's a win that you had today and stay grounded. Um, and when you're working with big clients and you're getting them on big TV shows to get those messages out, it can be really, really easy to let yourself run away with that. Um, and to remember that, you know, again, it was a great win for today, but remember who you are, remember what you're doing. Um, you know, remember the message and that you might have a client come in that, you know, has 10,000 followers and three people work for them. And that account is just as important yeah. as this major car dealer that you've, or, or major car maker that you've just placed, you know, again on Oprah. So do you remember a story of one of your first big, big wins? Wow. I'm so bad at my own big wins. I had somebody tell me something the other day that I did that I completely forgot that I did. I wasn't prepared for that. Um, I really, for me, the big wins are helping people see their value and their worth and why their story has meaning and impact. Um, we had a recent big win though, where we got a client in People Magazine from a cold pitch on Twitter. And Sweet. 
it was so much right place, right time. But you know, she's a she's a woman in business. She's as a black woman has a black um, black owned hairstylist salon. They managed to make it through the pandemic. This writer in the UK is a freelancer, and she's desperate to get somebody with this type of skill set. So to be able to bring those people together to help that freelancer succeed and land a huge placement at People to help this business owner who's now struggled through COVID and is figuring out how to bring people back into her salon, you know, two years later to be able to put them together because part of it was right place at right time, right time. But the other part of it was having the experience to know exactly how to, um, how to pitch that story, how to position that, and then how to counsel our counsel our clients so that she was really letting her expertise shine and taking all of the things she knew and boiling it down to be able to answer five really specific questions so that she got that placement. That was an amazing amazing win. Um, Are you on Twitter a lot? I was on Twitter more when it was called Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) When it was an X? Yeah. When it was an X. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, I'm much less frequently on there now, but I'm I'm still GG underscore Peterkin. And I, I still have my presence there and I will never give that up until Twitter goes away. I really, yeah. I've worked hard for that real estate um, and I'll always stay there. But the, the hashtag journo and hashtag PR requests on Twitter used to be really valuable ways for people to connect. And really? I think- how How so? People could go on as uh, journalists could just go on. And if, if they had a, cl- if they had somebody back out of a story, if their editor did a pivot on them and they need and they had that especially last minute request to be able to put that hashtag journal request and spit it out there. Um, and for those of us who know to follow it or following wow. it, it's really the ability to make some quick connections and turn around and, you know, we'd build a network on that. So if, if we couldn't help to then be able to QT or, or RT that and put it out to get seen by people that might not have seen it otherwise, you know, it's, it's a lot more effective in that scenario than it is the individual emails and phone calls that a writer might find themselves doing. Can you bring me through your personal progression on all of these digital playgrounds that we call social media and how, <laughs> how it's yeah. gone from you know, digitally getting a placement on People Magazine, which actually was a magazine, but now there's the digital edition, and then there's com, yeah. social, and then there's the social side, to which stories also have the social piece, which is an mm-hmm. Instagram piece or a tweet to the article. You know, there's so many different ways that we consume media. I would love to hear, you know, kind of for you, how did you find it useful in the beginning, or was it not useful in the beginning? Like you know, back when Facebook came out. Hey everyone, uh, Avi Gorin, CEO and co-founder of Marquee, and I want to talk about the customer journey for a second. You never know, as a restaurant owner, where your guests are truly coming from. End of the day, we do see some patterns around two types of search behaviors: direct versus discovery. Direct search, for an example, would be jumping into Google and saying Cali barbecue hours, right? I know where I want to go to eat, but I'm missing a key detail. I need a little bit more information. Discovery, which is the bulk of searches, is barbecue in San Diego, restaurants near me, takeout near me, right? One of the best ways to be found for more discovery searches is leveraging keywords. Reviews are basically free content for you to leverage. Think about keywords that are relevant to your brand, your location, and include as many of those in your review responses as possible, right? How can you go about doing this? Let's set up reports, utilize tools like Google Trends, find out what's going on in your area and how you can help leverage these keywords and review responses because someone else is doing that, right? If you need some examples, you could do anything from including summer menu, gluten-free menu, um, Leverage specific menu items like the dreaded and beloved spice pumpkin anything in your review responses, right? Let them know what's coming. Let your reviewers know something they should come back and try. And of course, if all of this just seems overwhelming and daunting because you're already running a a, a restaurant and have enough on your plate, just leverage the team at Marquee to do this for you. We handle all of this. We're experts in this space. We can automate this. So it's just another item that you know you are taking care of. Again, that's marquee.com, M-A-R-Q-I-I, 
M-A-R-Q-I-I.com. No you. However, we did recently buy M-A-R-Q-U-I-I.com. So if you do misspell it, we got you. You'll still find us. We can still help you. Um, yeah. So before Facebook came out and was available to those of us who weren't in college anymore, yes. um, you know, Slack and I think a few other internal um, bulletin boards were being used. I, I worked for a while as a contractor and then in-house at AstraZeneca. Okay. So it's something when you've got employees across um, Europe, the UK and the US, and they all have to be rowing in one direction, you know, having this online bulletin board, it's quicker than email. Yep. So that's something that we were using a lot. And I started to hear about um, Twitter and I started to, I started to hear about other things that were outside that weren't born yet because I had a lot of connections of folks in the tech space. Um, I was like lucky enough to be an alpha user on Google plus if anybody remembers yeah, that. Of course. So, <laughs> that. um, knowing that there were these other ways that people could communicate, what if, so what if we could take that and open up our communications, it got really tricky banking and pharmaceuticals specifically, which is where I was based, um, cause it's regulated and you so want to go out and be able to talk to your, for me, it was always about talking to the people who were going to ultimately touch and use the product or the service that I was involved in creating messages for. That to me is always that the biggest benefit of that and being able to have that. I mean, I used to say Twitter was like a dinner party. Yeah. And you could just go and you find yourself sitting next to the most interesting people, yeah. but you're sitting next to people and have a conversation. And it really helped me remember how to guide myself and then people I was training, how to guide them that you're not just a blind person behind a keyboard spitting things out to somebody who's not really a person. You're actually sitting next to them. If you were sitting next to them and you could turn and look at them, how would you interject yourself into the conversation what would you bring up? What would you want to ask them and for them to know about you? So for me, it's taking all of those non-digital lessons and applying yeah. them to that platform to build these connections that have spanned continents and decades and uh, put me in some really fun and interesting positions and allowed me to help some people out. So in the beginning, it was about expanding that base of folks that we could talk to and get some real time responses it's sometimes i have to remind myself that's still at the heart of it all even though yeah. it's all about well i don't know how to use tiktok or you know what's the biggest trending audio or you know it, it's so easy to get caught up in the machinations of of how people are going to view that content and sometimes i just want to go old school and be like here's a story i want to tell you and oftentimes those are the things that i just kind of spit out that yeah. get the biggest response isn't that interesting i it think <laughs> i think when you know when i i talk to business owners on all different small business owners big business owners and people in marketing <laughs> talking about social media and trying to let them know of the the availabilities that we have to communicate with the world our thoughts and our, our ideas um on platforms like twitter um like x uh, like Clubhouse, how you and I connected and how mm -hmm. so many of these, you know, we put on this podcast so that hopefully somewhere, someone on earth um, can find this valuable so that they can learn more about public relations so that they can, you know, ask more intelligent questions if they're looking to hire an agency. Um, mm -hmm. If they, you know, want to learn more, they're able to connect with you. I know, and I have an inherent belief that the internet is just truly a gift and it's so early it's so early for us to understand the impact and the magnitude of what we're doing um you know i have my my grandfather who raised me he was my i never met my father he was the person that raised me that at the end of his life asked if if i would be willing to help him write his life story and i was able to help him write his life story but when i think of how much that meant to him how much that meant to me how much it means that it's in the village that he grew up Mm -hmm. that's what's put me to where I am now knowing that other people have stories too. And if other people have stories, we don't have any excuses of, you don't need to write a book anymore. <laughs> like, you know, you can interview somebody like you did with your tape recorder back in the day, mm -hmm. your family members, 
and you can get the story of who that you know the stories that we hear at the thanksgiving table the third the stories that we hear yeah. over christmas that we take you know uh, unfortunately most of us myself included we take those stories for granted until they're gone yeah and then we wonder we really do it's so it's it's funny to me that the oral storytelling the first method method of storytelling and that people were able to pass things down with generation generations to generations and now we've got more ways to communicate than we ever did before yeah. and yet i feel like we're losing so much more of that history um and you know and i am always fascinated by the ways that this sort of makes us feel more separate instead of connected sometimes online and social because it's I don't know if it's spreading us too thin yeah. or if it's, or what it's doing, but I think it's really great that you had that, um, that exposure and that, that mentor through your grandfather and that kind of ability to know that story that way that well, you might not have had otherwise. I, yeah. And I think, you know, when it comes down to why we believe in the things that we believe and why I was so excited to talk to you today is that it's easier than ever, but it also takes an expertise. You know, it also takes yeah. the willingness to ask for help. You know, it's such a hard lesson for me of figuring out there's things that I'm good at. There's things that I'm not good at. Why can't I ask for help? And where have I figured out how to get better at asking for help for mm -hmm. you building your own business? You mm -hmm. used to work for other agencies. Then you created your own how did you learn how to create your own and what do you wish you had 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 known now that you're this far into the journey? I wish I had had, um, and it's funny that you say this because I really think I stopped and thought, why haven't I done this? I wish I had had a few semesters of business school under my belt because I feel <laughs> like I know the people part of it, but the yeah. business part of it and the expansion part of it, which is really where we are. Like we, we yeah. get to a certain point where it's like um, you're at a sink or swim and or not even sink or swim but you know stay or or grow yeah. so uh, how how did i create it i just did it i just decided um i i had a feeling i had a gut feeling that there was a need for certain types of business owners to be represented um i spent about three days doing research i mean god's honest truth and saw that the data bore it out and then i just i'm a creative first so i thought okay um, who am I talking to? What's my message? And I went and made a website and the pandemic happened during our launch. And I think it was probably the best thing ever because it brought me to clubhouse Yeah, and it brought me to a lot of connections with people. And I will say that the, the, about six months into our business. So we were about six months in and for the next 12 months after that, 90% of our clients came from clubhouse. That's amazing because we were all kind of focused on this one thing. It was this one town square that it felt like we were all coming to if we were on social audio, regardless mm -hmm. of where we were stuck in the real world. Um, so I think uh, what I wish I had known though before, I wish I had had more collaborators in the beginning and I'm looking to bring more collaborators on now. We had a COO for a little while um, who's fantastic. Uh, but didn't have the PR background or the sales background. So it's it's finding the right people at the right time and, and bringing them together. And I would say that for any business owner, even if it's a solopreneurship that you're starting with, um, have a mentor, have somebody to be that sounding board, not so much to get permission or or anything, but just to help you when you get rudderless. I think we all get rudderless at some point in time or another, and we just need somebody to help us out. So collaboration and a true business sense, I yeah. think would have been really good. And we're working on building that up now too. So what are the, what are the goals? Where do you see what, what you're building? I mean, what, what are the, what are the dreams? Um, I, I would like to spin off the media relations to be a more independently functioning piece and actually have a, a media relations arm. Again, so many folks that come to a full service agency want those media placements. Yeah. So media and, and folding in now that we're post pandemic and event staff arm underneath that, events are a huge part of PR yep. that people really overlook everything from, if you're speaking on a stage, if you're hosting an event, if you're going to an event, there's so many opportunities that folks 
don't think to take advantage of unless they have somebody to counsel them on. Give us give us some tips. If somebody's gets a gets booked as a speaking yeah. event in 2024, what should they what should they be doing? If you're going to speak in 20, if you're going to speak, the first thing I want you to do is to ask that event organizer that brought you on, hey, when you put your media list together, are you going to be sharing that with the attendees? Um, if not, can you share that with me? Why? And and if they don't, if they're not putting a media list together, then I want you to ask them to email me so that we can help them <laughs> out with that. Uh, if if somebody's hosting a conference and they're not providing press passes and inviting at least the local media to come and cover them, they're missing a huge opportunity. So that's the first thing that should definitely be happening. Um, so get that media list first and foremost when you're thinking about talking to this audience and sharing your expertise, who in that area is writing about it who's going to be there and just invite them, invite them to your talk, see if they have time to grab a coffee, tell them what your talk is going to be about and see if it's going to be of benefit to their readers, either now or down the line and just build those relationships. So that is just a big, big area that folks can use that. Um, we've even helped people. I saw this first at South by Southwest, probably a decade ago, the podcasters lounge. Yes. Um, so if you are like Sean and a speaker and a podcaster, just, just look for all those opportunities. You know, are they going to have a podcaster's lounge? If not, can you help them set it up? Yeah. And can you trade that? You know, maybe you have one speaker's ticket. Well, for another ticket for my head of sales, we can help set you up a podcaster's lounge and do yep. X, Y, Z for that. Like I said, there's lots of opportunities and it's at the heart of it, PR is going to be about building relationships, which sounds so trite, but it's just so, so true. What, what does building relationship mean to you? Like if you say media relations, what is the relationship between PR and media? Oh, this is a <laughs> book. This is a novel. Um... <laughs> Tell me a story. Yeah, well, the, in the good old days, you always, you know, you knew who was the head of the desk at the Washington Post, who's the head of the news desk, who's the head of the features. Um, you're really looking to build relationships with people, though, because we've seen so much change. There's been so many layoffs in so many newsrooms across the country because of partially because of social media and the rise yeah. of citizen journalists. But for us, media relations, it's two part. It's the it's the relationship between us as an agency and all of our media specialists and the reporters, the editors, the producers out there in the world um, beyond placing that story. Hey, Joe, the last time we talked, I remember you saying your kid was going to graduate. How did it go? You know, send me some pictures. For us, those things are just as crucial as, yeah. you know, I have a client who's uh, an expert on narcissism, and I know that's a big topic, you know, can they get 10 minutes on your show, which is never what we would pitch, but at yeah. the end of the day, that's the conversation that you're going to have. So, um, and, and there's a lot of freelancers out there in the world. So media relations is people coming to us and saying, I want my CEO featured in this magazine and I need you to make that happen. And can you guarantee us, you know, 10 placements in, you know, international press? Um, yeah. So that's, that's a big part of media placement, media relations. Um, you asked me another question. So, yeah. So relationships for us are more than transactional. And I guess yeah. that's the quickest way to answer that question. If you're just having a transactional, what can you do for me um, kind of thing and waiting for them to come and say what you can do for them and aren't really interested in the person, can it work? Sure. Uh, is it going to transcend and, and go as far, you know, are they going to really be there for you in a pinch? Well, probably not, but would you, could you? You know, no, you're going to invest your limited time in folks that you think really care about you. So that is kind of the whole building relationship piece. Um, and it's hard to focus on that when you're like, I just wrote a book and I need it to sell. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
you say on your website, the most PR cam campaigns don't last past one media cycle. What do you mean? Um, if I decide that I'm going to take this interview and use it to promote my business and I just talk about it once, that's a media cycle. But if I say, Hey, Sean, you know, do you mind if, if, can I can I download this? Can I can I put this on my website? Can I host this someplace that it's now becoming part of the media that I own and can repurpose? And that's where people again miss the boat. It's really easy to get excited because you just got an interview on Good Day Chicago and be excited about that. But if you don't have a PR rep, please contact that producer and say, "Hello, yes. Mr. Producer. First of all, thank you." It was yeah. great to work with you. And second of all, can I get a copy of this? Um, you know, is, is there a Dropbox where I can go download even a portion of this so I can put it up on, on my site? You know, how can you take that? I don't care if you're using your, your phone and you're playing it on your phone and you're yeah. doing a screen record. Get it so that you can take it because once they're, once it falls off of their website, once they're done promoting it, if you haven't taken it and you can't reuse it, well, then it was good for a minute. But I'm so happy all. that you're educating people about that. It's one of the biggest lessons that we learned, you know, hoping that we would get on the local news and then finally mm -hmm. getting on the local news. And it's amazing to, you know, go to CBS or Fox or KUSI or any of these local places. But what's even better, which we learned was that we need to promote our appearance going there. Because mm -hmm. our audience on Facebook or our audience on Instagram or our email newsletter, like they want to know because they want to be happy. For, like they want to turn on the news and go, hey, there's Sean. Like, mm -hmm. I'm so happy that, you know, that's our restaurant. Like, look, like now everybody's winning, mm -hmm. but you can't expect the news to do that. You have to do that right? Like exactly. that's the extra work. <laughs> that's the extra work. And you don't want to hope that somebody just turns it on and sees you, but then What's even better, Sean, is a year from now yes. when that topic comes up again that you can go and share and say, you know, a year ago when we did this program, we talked about this very thing and this is what we had to say and then you can share it. So you've got your messaging, you've got your increased credibility because you were invited on a new show, which is really what PR can do for you. It's not just you saying it. It's like, whoa, they invited this guy in a news program to talk about this. I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to what he has to say because they thought it was, he was good enough for them to broadcast to their listeners. So, you know, take that, reuse it, reshare it. You can't expect that everybody has seen it um, or that if they saw it, they're going to remember it. And if you can reach and help more people, keep reusing that content for sure. What is the, what does the ideal client look like? Because there's probably plenty of clients that come in with misconceptions of what PR is, and it's going to be the the magic bullet that's going to help them raise more capital or open yeah. up another product line or sell, you know, get the top, the New York Times bestseller list for their book. Like w those are the misconceptions. Tell us mm -hmm. about the misconceptions. And then w what does the best clients, like what kind of encouragement can you give to people that are looking to get into media relations, get in, hire a PR agency? Um, how can we be better? <laughs> <laughs> wow. You can be your best advocate. So the best clients are people who are if they don't have these questions answered, are going to be willing to answer these questions. Um, what is your brand story? Can you share that with us? Um, because we're going to take that and then use it to make it more PR ready in terms of actually talking directly to somebody. Who is your spokesperson? If you're coming to us because you want to be on XYZ News and your CEO is shy then fine. <laughs> Who is going to be the face of this, this storytelling? It has to be somebody. Um, you know, it's not enough to just go talk about your products over and over again. That's a sales campaign. That's great. You don't need us for that. Yeah. So um, have a spokesperson and then allow us to train them. Even if they have stepped on stage a million times in front of audiences, even if they've given press interviews before, um, be open to sitting down with us to be trained, um, especially if you're doing any sort, if you have any sort of product or service that can at all invite controversy. 
There's a thing called blocking and bridging. You want to know what that is. If a hard question comes your way, you want to be able to deflect it and then bridge back to the actual thing that you want to talk about. There's a skill. It's not that it's magic. Anybody can learn it. But again, an ideal client lets us lets us um, teach them that. And I guess the final thing would be if you really are looking for press as part of this PR, um, remember you're going to have to be available. If that producer or editor gets in touch with us and wants to talk to you at 5.30 a.m. on Thursday, the answer really isn't, oh, it's too early, I'm busy, can we do it another day? You know, be ready for that period of time for your answer to be yes, yeah. quite frankly. Um, or or recognize mm -hmm. that maybe this isn't the best time for me to be going on a media blitz. Maybe I need to be creating some other sort of pieces and then we can talk about things that we can do, whether it's a media kit, you know, an author kit, some sort of some sort of other press kit or Q and A um, that we can put you on, or even satellite they used to call them satellite media tours, where you sort of set the parameters and invite people to come to you. So what kind of advice do you have if someone does get the opportunity to go on media, national media or local media, when mm -hmm. it comes to a call to action that isn't transactional, but actually is impactful for their business? Oh, it's funny because most of our calls to actions are transactional. I know, the right? the, uh, yeah. And, and we, I love to say the uh, difference between a conversation and an interview is a call to action. If you're going on any sort of interview and you don't have a call to action, I would say, you know, part of it's let the timing be your guide and, and again, be authentic. You know, right now, anybody that we would be sending out, the call to action that we would be inviting folks to would be to go to their Giving Tuesday campaign, Yeah, you know, around this time of year. So I would say, think about hopefully your business, what are you doing for your community? And how can you yep. invite those listeners to participate in that action and find you that way? Because you've already done a great job promoting yourself. You've had this interview. People know more about who you are and what you do. So think about that call to action in terms of your community. What are you doing to help and how can you invite these other folks to come along for that ride? And they'll stick around and find out more about you in terms of that. So, and if you don't have something, Put something together, you know, first of all, say to yourself, well, why don't I have something to help my community? I, you know, I operate inside of this. These people are all my customers and then challenge yourself to, I don't care if it's a food drive. I don't care if it's a community cleanup. I don't care if it's an art contest and whoever wins is going to get, you know, a free lunch at your establishment, create something fun that people can actually participate in and that they can associate with your brand. And that'll go a really long way. So we have a lot of obviously hospitality professionals, small uh, mm -hmm. hospitality companies, and then bigger units that listen to this executives. Can you give some advice specific to the restaurant industry of what they should be doing to try to get more media attention, but what, what things that they can be doing? I mean, uh, you know, focus on the customer. What, what are you doing to truly stand out either in your industry and how are you telling that story? There's a thousand people possibly who do what you do. There's yeah. a bunch of burger joints. Nobody's making burgers for the same reason that you are and nobody's doing it the same way that you are. So I would say you really need to understand that part of your story and then think about how is sharing that story going to be of interest we like to say, where does your brand fit inside of the cultural conversation, which sounds kind of lofty, but what's going on right now out in the world yeah. that you have something to say that is so different and unique that people need to hear about it now. And that time's not going to come 365 days out of the year, but I guarantee you if you're paying attention. So if you really want to see, start doing, do some Google searches. Yeah. You know, just do some Google searches on stories about, you know, the best hamburgers. A lot of what we do is research for folks. Um, we don't use Google. We use some other media tools that kind of cost a ton of dough. I wouldn't recommend somebody <laughs> going out and investing in. 
Yeah. But we want to see what types of stories have been covered. What are the headlines? What are people talking about? And then we want to be able to go to our client and say, okay, this is what's been talking about in restaurants for the last six months. This is this is where your story fits. This is the opportunity that we see where they haven't been talking about it. Or this is your differentiator. They've all been talking about it over here. And you've got a story that's really amazing if we just take two steps to the left. And we want you to go out and talk about that. So why are you doing what you do? What makes you different? Um, and how does it have an impact for the audience of the producer, the reporter, the editor? Because at the bottom, the end of the day, they really want to know what their audience what's going to give them the clicks. So once you know that on your side, then go do some research in terms of the outlets that you think would want to write about you and find out what's important to their audience. Go look at their websites, pick up yeah. their magazines, see what they're, see how they're positioning. You'll see the, um, you know, you'll see the law and order formula <laughs> that shows up. Yes. If you just can look for it. And yeah, if this sounds like a whole other job, it is. And that's, <laughs> is. Why that's why, that's why my, my is. career exists. <laughs> um, uh, that's fantastic. But there are ways you can do it, like really a half hour a day. And at the end of a month, you'll have so much more information than you did if you just hadn't started. So uh, you can find Gigi at Gigi underscore Peterkin. Um, that's on Instagram. You say in your bio that you're a disruptor of the tired status quo. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, my God. I am so tired of seeing the same people <laughs> tell the same stories about the same thing. Thank and you. they all yes. look the same way. So, <laughs> um, and I and I don't take a contrarian point of view, but if I feel like if I feel like the same three leaders are being upheld as the boons for business, and then I also know behind the scenes, oh, they've been charged with X, Y, and Z, and they're not really good guys, and yep. there's all these people over here, those are the people I'm going to be talking about. And I'm also going to tell you why, you know what, a working parent doesn't have the same 24 hours in a day as the single guy who has just graduated with no single with no student loans. So please don't shame them and tell them they're not working hard enough. That's what I mean by that. I think that there's so many tropes that we pull out without really thinking about the people behind them and that people sometimes build their businesses off the backs of that. And I'm kind of tired of that shit. So I love it. I love it. Uh, every single week on the on multiple social audio apps so on wednesday and on friday 10 a.m pacific time 1 p.m eastern time uh gg myself people like troy hooper jason berkowitz heather um heather cox from heather cox codes um so many incredible leaders are uh, join our digital hospitality community and we hope that you the listener the viewer join us if you send me a direct message on instagram at sean p walchef i will send you a link we want to hear your story we want you to come on stage we want you to ask gg some follow-up questions um that can help you with your pr strategy um book a call with her um, check out Amplify PR. We'll put a link in the show notes so that you can go visit her website, follow her on Instagram. Uh, Gigi, is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to? Somebody that uh, has made a profound impact in the recently that um, you know would enjoy listening to to this interview? Oh, somebody would enjoy listening. I would. Well, other than you, uh, Mandy <laughs> Graziano has ah, Mandy. made a huge impact recently. I've been really checking out her book and i think she does a lot of pr right but i think she knows a lot of people in her circle who could be benefited by this so i would love for her to listen and share wow, um, mandy she will she's awesome she's, she's great i have yeah. loved getting to know her for sure sales tales uh, we'll put a link to mandy's book in the episode as well i also interviewed mandy on the show so um, you can check out her episode but gg peterkin it's truly an honor uh disruptor of the tired status quo <laughs> i really appreciate uh, your leadership thank you for leading some of the rooms on clubhouse and on uh, linkedin audio and thank you for what you do um, giving a voice to some of the people that are voiceless or some people that are very significant but they don't know the right message to share at the right time 
Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for asking me to come on and thanks for everything that you do. It's been amazing watching this whole uh, media empire that you're building grow. It's really <laughs> well, very cool. And I, I love that you're teaching everybody to do, to be their own media experts. I think it's really needed. Um, and I think it's a great thing that you're doing. So thank well, you. I can't do it alone. I, you know, I've got Stover and TJ and Toby and yeah. JC. I've got a, a whole whole team of people behind me um, that make this magic happen. But I'm grateful uh, for people like you that show up that allow us to to share stories and to connect with. I mean, we have people all over the globe that are part of this digital hospitality community. And we hope that you, the listener, if this is your first time listening, you're part of the community. Please, uh, as always, stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. And we'll catch you guys next week. Bye. Thanks.